I'm Erin Summers, uh, and before I start, I just want to thank Sarah and Noreen and everybody here at the center um, and the other fellows. It's an honor to read with you guys. Um, and I also want to say that it has been a crazy year to be alive on this planet, and this, is, this place and this fellowship has been a port in the storm. So thank you. Um, I'm going to read the first few pages of a new story. It's called Waltz. Up until her 40th year, there hadn't been a season of Marion's life that she hadn't had to grovel and beg, send off invoice reminders couched in manic cheer, just checking in. At 40, all of that changed. She bought a house in the Hudson Valley that seemed occupied solely by arty people and made a hobby of overpaying for furniture. She spent $5,899 on an antique chest of drawers, laughed as they loaded it into her car. What's funny, asked the guy with the dolly. Where to begin, she said. The children adjusted instantly. They shrugged off their old lies like winter coats on the first real day of spring. Marion never caught them pining or calling the friends they'd left behind. She bought them anything they asked for, and they asked for a lot. Sophie wanted a horse, and Dave wanted a BMX bike. It's not exactly fair, is it, she said to them. Horses eat tons of grain and have to be boarded. BMX bikes eat almost nothing. She loved them equally, so she got them each one of each. The horses lived 10 minutes away in a stable, stable surrounded by green grass. The BMX bikes lived in the garage. One afternoon, the children's father came to visit. He walked around peeking into rooms and doing that low whistle of his. The house was huge, simple, and old, everything that impressed him. He pointed at different features and pronounced their names, wainscoting, crown molding, antique mahogany tall boy, and at the stable, steeds. <laughs> They're Morton Zombie, Sophie said to him. The children had found the horse's original names unsatisfactory. As a policy, Marion let the children do whatever they wanted, and in return, they worshiped her. Their father laughed, zombie? Marion reached out and touches, touched the horse's velvety nose. She was afraid of him, of his shuddering animal intelligence, but it seemed important to demonstrate that they were all together on one side against the children's father. What's wrong with it? Dave chose it. He's seven. I know how old he is. Don't insult me. Why does a seven-year-old need a horse? He's gone this whole time without one, said Marion, and without other things, too. The amount of Batmobiles he wished for and didn't get could fill a truck. How could notional toys fill a truck, asked their father, whose name was also Dave. <laughs> Marion felt like divorcing him all over again. Zombie sneezed. The air in the stable was filled with particles of blonde dirt floating around in beams of light. Marion took in a lungful and explained that the children adored the horses and were very sweet about brushing them and shoveling their dung and such, which proved ipso facto that they deserved them. You had to use words like ipso facto with the children's father if you wanted him to pay attention. Dave Sr. laughed and said, if you say so. Do you want to see me ride, asked Sophie. Why not, said Dave Sr. They got the stable manager to, take, to help take Mort out. Sophie rode him around while the rest of them leaned against the split rail fence. She wore a round black helmet and sporty jod purse. Beyond the, the dirt enclosure, a field extended to the tree line. Heavy clouds inched over it. It was a spectacle. The turn of muscle, the blue creep of thunderheads. Sophie with her cruel posture and shiny boots like the officer of a preteen cavalry. God, she's a natural, said Dave Sr. Now that he mentioned it, Mary, Marion could see that it was true. She had an inborn lightness that seemed suited for horseback. Possibly they'd found her calling. They'd only had to vault about three social classes to do it. The wind picked up, and it was time to get Mort back inside. Dave Jr. ran on ahead to say goodbye to Zombie. Marion zipped up her new summer weight jacket, pleased to have discovered its purpose. Dave Sr. Strolled al strode along next to her. So you're what, going to live in that big house with the kids and do nothing? That had been her plan, but she could tell from his tone what he thought of it. Hardly, she said. I'm volunteering with Holocaust survivors. This statement caused her mild horror. She wondered how the Holocaust had ended up in the part of her brain she mined for self-serving lies. <laughs> his face showed admiration. Really? Absolutely, she said. It's the least I can do. Well, that's nice. That's really worthy. He was silent after that. She had found the one brand of moral super superiority that actually worked on him. Why had she never thought of it before? They went home and hauled the BMX bikes out of the garage and rode them in circles around the driveway. Marion even took a turn, and so did Dave Sr. Fat raindrops fell at intervals, dotting the pavement. I don't get it, said Dave Sr., pedaling. How is it different from a regular bike? Marion realized that he was jealous, that he wanted a gift of his own. He wanted the boring equivalent of a horse or a BMX bike. 
It was in her nature to let them all have everything, to treat money like a cold river flowing over her palm. She had always been like that, even back in the city. It had been part of the problem. They're for doing tricks, she said, and attempted a wheelie. She fell off backwards and bashed her skull on a row of raised bricks that lined the driveway. Unconsciousness flared up like a black flame and filled her with deep relief. How wonderful to lie in one's driveway for a moment, feeling nothing. When she came to, they were all in the house. Someone had laid her sticky, bleeding head on the arm of the sofa. You're ruining it, said Sophie, said Sophie pointing. Marion sat up and looked at the spot, dark red on the light blue upholstery and spreading. We'll get ten new ones, yawned Marion, touching her gashed head. You shouldn't be so reckless, said Dave Sr. You're 40 years old. Is that all, she said? She felt 60 at least, achy and wise, modestly triumphant, like she'd won a fight she'd been reluctant to join in the first place. You're setting a bad example for them, said Dave Sr. He had a point. She turned to the children. Don't do wheelies after age 39. <laughs> Dave Jr. went into the kitchen and brought back a damp wad of paper towels. Press this against it, he said. Finally, a caring Dave, said Marion. Thank you, baby. She held the paper towels to the wound. To the wound. You shouldn't call him that, said Dave Sr. When boys are coddled by their mothers, it messes them up for life. And when elephants are raised without fathers, they go on to rape rhinos, she said. <laughs> what, said Dave Sr.? An article I read. He looked at her, annoyed. She explained, the males get poached. It throws the whole thing out of whack. You're really something, he said. Breaking news, said Sophie. And they all laughed because she sounded exactly like Marion. It was cozy in there for a second, the bloody sofa, the rain outside, everyone bickering like they used to. I suppose you need to go to the hospital, said Dave Sr. after a while. You lost consciousness. Marion scowled, no. Then she remembered they were insured now. Yes, she said. <laughs> they went back out into the rain and got in the car. Thanks, guys. Uh, hey everybody, uh, my name is Dan Sheehan, uh, and I'd also like to say just a huge thank you to Sarah, Noreen, um, Rosie, and John, all the staff at the center, um, and to all my fellow fellows. It's been fantastic to get you to know you this past year, uh, and just a wonderful experience in general. So um, I'm going to read a section from a novel that's coming out next spring uh, called Restless Souls, and it's a tragic comic novel, but this extract is not comic, it's really, really bleak, so I'm sorry about that in advance. Um, uh, I think all you need to know is it's set in Sarajevo in Dublin during the 1990s, um, and this is a passage about a suicide, so. Um, Gabriel Hogan hanged himself from the goalposts of our local football pitch, where we shot penalties together as children. The idea of that won't ever leave me. None of us were where we should have been the day he dropped. I was walking the beach less than half a mile away, trying to decide whether I'd leave for America with Clara or stay put, fancying myself a man who did his best thinking against the backdrop of dark sea swells. Mal was on what may or may not have been a date with a prickly local girl called Helen. Tom was sprinting across a bombed out street somewhere in Sarajevo, trying to dodge sniper fire, maybe. Or maybe he was sitting in a windowless back room smoking an overpriced black market cigarette or listening to a crackling radio broadcast to help him understand the language or just sleeping beside his girl. There were deep welts scratched into Gabriel's neck when they found him, like he might have had a change of heart one split second too late. Though probably it was just the instinct towards self-preservation that all creatures have when the noose is tightening. I had questions in the wake of it. Big existential questions, pointless questions, like how can you grow up alongside someone, love them as fiercely as if they were your own flesh and blood, and not know? How can you share a home and a life and two decades of history with them and not see the change happening? There was a time when he couldn't have, he couldn't have hidden that kind of darkness from me, a time when it was just us, when there was no one else we needed, when he would have told me. That evening and all that came after it, it might never have happened. Myself and Mal standing silent in our suits and scuffed shoes with Eugene and Therese, girls he had loved and chased away, lads from the neighborhood, from our school days, from football teams long disbanded and forgotten, all of us watching uselessly as they lowered his coffin into the damp ground. He was buried in Glasnevin, 
in the sprawling garden cemetery that houses everyone from fallen patriots to unbaptized babies. Strategists and foot soldiers from opposing sides of the Civil War lie side by side there, some of them brothers. People leave bottles of stout and the headstones of alcoholic riders and flowers for generals cut down in their prime. There's a plot for the nameless cholera victims of a 19th century tenement outbreak and a giant round tower to house Daniel O'Connell, the great liberator. There's every kind of death imaginable in that cemetery. And now there's Gabriel. As the 10 of us gathered at his graveside, taking turns dropping fistfuls of soil down on top of him, I thought about how many suicide victims sleep in that earth, their official certificates reading death by misadventure, their newspaper obituaries vague and ashamed. Gabriel's was an open casket, but the makeup didn't fully cover the choker of purple bruising the rope left behind. To this day, the only person to use the word suicide in relation to his death, aside from Mal when he's six pints in or mid-bout of nervous verbal diarrhea, is one of the two idiot teenagers who stumbled across him while downing stolen cans of cider in the park. They waited an hour before calling the police, shitting themselves over the prospect of being caught in a less than lucid state. The notion that these two gangly, panicked fuckwits were the only company Gabriel had at the end still makes my heart thump. Six days after the funeral, one of them turned up on my doorstep, all pimples and greasy hair in an oversized Metallica hoodie, and started jabbering breathlessly about how he felt connected to Gabriel since he found his corpse. The lad actually used the word corpse, like he was describing an extra from the thriller video. I let him finish. There's something about this kind of train wreck speechifying that transfixes me. When he was done, he blew some hair out of his eyes and made a move to walk past me into the house. I put a hand on his dandruff powdered shoulder and looked at him solemnly for a long second before saying, get the fuck out of here, you ghoulish little bollocks. I have not for one second in the two years since this happened felt bad about it. Meanwhile, the phones were still down in Sarajevo. Our first three letters didn't make it through. I couldn't stop imagining them stacking up in an empty post office miles away from anyone while Tom lay, unidentifiable, on a metal slab in a crumbling morgue in a crumbling city, ash on every surface. Gabriel was buried two weeks before word finally reached him. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sulma Ortiz Fuentes. And um, before I read, I want to thank the Center for Fiction. Um, receiving this fellowship was one of the best things that happened to me in 2016, so I really appreciate it. I'm going to read a, a, a part of a story. Um, it's called El Arabe. And I apologize also because it's a bit dark. But uh, here we go. Hope you like it. Life was never the same for Elisa and her husband after the Arab peddler's car ran over their three-year-old son. Not that it had ever been easy between them, but still, when Tonito was buried four days later, four days after being killed, Juan Manuel was another man. He'd gone completely crazy at the sight of his son, his son's shattered skull crushed like an overripe calabaza against the sun-baked earth. The accident happened right in front of the home they shared with the three little boys that were conceived in a hurry and born with barely a pause in between. They'd married in haste also a few months after Elisa flashed her tetas at Juan Manuel while he was farming in the hill behind her parents' house. He's as good a prospect as you're going to get, her mother encouraged. Elisa agreed. She was the eldest of 12, not a big sister, but a fourth second mother by the time her third sibling came along when she was five. At 13, as her body developed its womanly curves, a mysterious hump appeared on her back. It was a deformity the town's only doctor didn't have a cure for, and the local curandero's oils and prayers lacked the power to reverse. She became known as La Joroba around the barrio, and unkind whispers followed her around that she was jinxed, a bruja, that disgruntled spirits from the nearby cemetery had settled on her shoulders. 
Pregnant women, fearing for their own unborn babies, averted their eyes and prayed to La Virgen for protection when they encountered her in the street. Men avoided her. And by, the, and by age 24, when most women in the mountains had too many children, Elisa was still unmarried. So she took matters into her own hands and soon found herself tied to Juan Manuel. Then her youngest son was killed. She discovered several things that Saturday afternoon. That being a second mother to 11 siblings wasn't the worst thing to happen to her. That having a hunched back was bearable after all that having a man wasn't necessary, and that being whispered about and called names was unimportant. No, it was the death of a child that could break a woman and splinter a man completely apart. The peddler arrived around noon, around midday. The powerful engine of his sturdy Chevy Impala easily conquering the uneven driveway that ran past Elisa's house. He traveled from town to town selling his wares, offering credit only to women, whose names and debts he kept in a marble composition notebook. No one knew his given name, which country he was from, or if indeed he was Arab. His Spanish was precise, with rolled R's and sibilant S's, and he never cut off the ending syllables of words like some in the mountains did. He could have been a descendant from one of the thousands of moriscos driven out of Spain centuries ago that made their way to Puerto Rico, but no one really knew. In any event, he was an olive-skinned, sharp-nosed man with hazel eyes who went around selling goods from the back seat and trunk of his car, which sufficed to earn him the nickname of El Arabe. He made the three-hour trip from San Juan to the center of the island through winding roads and hairpin curves that startled prayers even out of non-believers. The backseat of his car arrived brimming with merchandise, colorful dresses and flashy costume jewelry for the ladies, sharp guayaveras and straw-colored Panama hats for the gentlemen, frocks riddled with bows and flounces for the girls, and shiny shoes to go with precisely creased pants for the boys. He had something for everyone, even for the abuelas who only dressed in the unforgiving color of mourning, but liked to wear delicate mantillas to church on Sundays, which he claimed came directly from Spain when he cut them fingering the wispy head coverings. As soon as word spread that El Arabe had arrived, women began to trickle down from the hills, their hard saved dollars tucked snugly inside bras or hidden in worn purses clutched securely under armpits. Children appeared out of nowhere to gather around the back of his car, eager to discover the treasures hidden within, waiting in suspense for him to lift the trunk like a magician and present with a flourish the strange toys and gadgets which until that moment they didn't know had been invented. El Arabe parked a short distance from Elisa's house. She and her children were the first to come out. After handing out sweet paletas to the boys, he said to her, look what I have for you, and pulled out a red flowing skirt from the back seat of his car. It looks just like you, he offered. She loved it immediately. She envisioned the soft material hugging her curves, because after all, there was nothing wrong with the bottom half of her body. They engaged in their regular back and forth, a hint of flirt clinging to their words. Twenty dollars, he began. No, senor, I only have ten. Bueno, pues, I'll let you have it for eighteen. No, 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 I only have ten, she insisted. Fifteen, then. No, yes, and so on, until he relented like always. Only for you, he said with a wink, because you're my favorite customer. Other women began to arrive. Elisa stayed to watch as they bantered and bartered with El Arabe, noticing what each bought and how much they spent. Finally, after telling her five-year-old to watch his four- and three-year-old brothers, she reluctantly went inside to make lunch, leaving the peddler and his car surrounded by women and children. Inside, Juan Manuel was sitting in the living room on a plastic-covered sofa, watching his favorite variety show from an ancient black-and-white television. She didn't bother showing him the skirt, 
Elisa never shared things like that with him. He'd scold her for being wasteful. Why do you need another skirt, he'd ask. Don't you have enough clothes? Where do you think you're going? He won't notice I'm wearing something new anyway, she reasoned, and walked to their bedroom without a word. She approached the misty mirror of the old chiffre robe standing guard over the, over the unmade bed and scattered piles of laundry and held the skirt up against her waist, turning this way and that, children, husband, and lunch forgotten. She imagined herself wearing the skirt to church the next day, paired with a yellow blouse, the one that fit perfectly over her back and the set of earrings, necklace, and bracelets earned from selling Avon products that still retain their gold wash. She'd receive admiring comments from other women after the service. Elisa, what a gorgeous skirt and blouse, they'd murmur as they looked her up and down. She saw herself responding, a la orden, come borrow the outfit whenever you need it. After that, she'd take a few turns around the plaza arm in arm with her sister Lucy, past the groups of admiring men always gathered around the edges watching the parade of women sauntering by, forgetting she was married, forgetting the joroba on her back, feeling beautiful in her new clothes. Elisa was humming into the mirror. In her mind, she was taking another turn around the plaza, just about to catch an admiring eye when the combined din of a car engine, abrupt shouts, and a horrified denial from Juan Manuel disturbed her fantasy. Disoriented, she remained still, allowing her surroundings to settle hesitantly around her, as if emerging from a dream. Maybe if she didn't move, she thought, the sounds would reveal themselves to be unrelated. But when her husband released an unbroken string of anguished howls, the new skirt Join the jumble of clothing on the floor. Forgetting compliments and good-looking men, Elisa ran through the house, a presentimiento growing that tomorrow she wouldn't be strolling around the plaza after church in a red skirt and yellow blouse bedecked in bright jewelry. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, thank you also to the, the Center for Fiction and to my fellow fellows. Uh, I'm going to be reading the first few pages of a short story entitled The Night Porter. Oh, uh, the title of the story is, oh, my name, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Danny Lorberbaum. As a boy, I followed the doctor's orders. Every morning began with 100 hand flexes as full of flex as I could manage, then a controlled slow release. I took an ice bath followed by a bath so hot my entire body blushed pink. I drank as much milk as my parents could afford. I ate beefsteak while they ate boiled beets. Throughout the day, I made bargains with myself. If I stepped over every crack in the sidewalk, if I held my breath for two full minutes, if I went a whole day without looking at my bad arm, not even in the bath, I swore, not even in the mirror. I prayed to God, read the Bible, and slept with the good book under my pillow. I played out hands of poker, me against a fake opponent, and always made sure I won. For years, I carried a rabbit's foot in my trouser pocket. I carried it even after the fur had fallen off, and it was unrecognizable, looking instead like the body of a wizened old mouse. But the sometimes prick of the claws on my thigh gave me strength and the weightlessness of it, the familiar shape of the thing in my pocket, that gave me a calm I'd rarely felt before. My arm, understand, is half the length it should be. My hand is limp, my fingers shriveled. Think of a tuber dug up from a city garden. The fingers dangle, as useless as growths. Has my arm always looked th like this? Was I born with it? Was it something that was somehow passed down from parent to child, like baldness or poverty, and now hangs over my life like a six-foot ceiling? Do I have dreams of having two normal arms and pushing a lawnmower up a hill, of driving a car with hands firmly on the wheel at 11 and 1? And in these dreams is a part of me aware that they are in fact dreams, and that sooner or later I'll wake up? Have I thought of lying naked in the bath and carving my arm off at the shoulder joint like a wing from a chicken carcass? 
Have I pricked it with pins and tacks? Have I beat it with my good fist until it was mottled and purpled with bruise? Have I let my fingernails grow as long as talons? Because what the hell, no one sees them under the tied off sleeve of my shirt anyway. Is the underside really marked up with shiny pink puckers where I've held it over candle flame? Does that mean the skin isn't exactly skin, but something closer to aged leather? Is it true that I've never made love with a woman, not because I've tried and failed, but because I'm afraid of what their face would reveal when I took off my shirt? Is 142 days the longest I've gone without making physical contact with another human being? And does that include bumping into someone on the street or trolley or train, or taking my change from the baker when I went out to buy a loaf of bread? And were those 142 days something I cherished? Something that I came to live for and mark tally by tally on a piece of cardstock on my nightstand? And when I walked the street or rode the trolley or train or took my change from the baker, was I sweaty with nerves that I'd be touched and like that my streak would end? And were there other times, like those 142 days, say, a time of 90 days or 75 days or 71 days or 68 days? And when each streak came to an end, did ashes settle over everything? And did that ceiling over my life lower itself from six to five feet? And did I weep into my pillow until the stuffing was soaked through completely, then begin my count anew? Years ago, I was a trash thrower for the city. I did one-armed push-ups, lifted paint cans till my biceps swelled as tight as a cannonball. The men called me freak, they called me gimp, but I could still throw trash with the best of them. My one good arm was better than two of theirs. I lived in a cold water garret. I was a church mouse living off crumbs. Every night my neighbor snored through the wall, and in my dreams the sound became a train chugging through flat winter farmland, yellow and white. It wasn't me in the dream, but a view of the train from above. The war was the best thing that could have happened to me. With only women to beat out for jobs, I was a kid in a candy store with a $2 bill. I became the night porter in a building downtown, meaning a furnished basement apartment, meaning the days were mine to sleep away in a room as dark and silent as a crypt, meaning my dreams of a train became dreams of a ship's anchor sinking endlessly through an ink black sea. Thank you. My name is Hafiz Lakani, and uh, I too would like to thank the Center for Fiction for this amazing fellowship and for uh, amazing company among the fellows. I'm going to read uh, from page uh, 84 of a novel that uh, I'm just completing. Uh, many thanks to the Center. And uh, what you should know is that this is from the perspective of a man named Anil who has been in the US for about 20 years, uh, originally from a uh, small fictitious town in India named uh, Rabobindi. And also, uh, at the time that he's uh, reflecting upon, he's been through a number of um, like businesses in the US, and uh, at this time, he owns a Dunkin' Donuts and has three children. At school, teacher reported, a Marine was quiet, often watching other children rather than playing with them. But for visits to music class, led by Miss Salis, woman with big red hair who always wore high-heeled boots, a Marine ran first in line, her reservations all but dissipated. Early on, it happened that Miss Salis assigned a Marine child's trumpet to play. And though most children prefer to sample every instrument if given chance, Amreen found her way back to this trumpet week after week, and then year after year. It was after school music lab, taught by Miss Zalis, which Amreen, who adored the red-haired teacher, most looked forward to twice each week. Music lab, I laughed to Amina in private, because I was so pleased such a thing existed. In grammar school, we shared between five boys, one textbook, studies coming only from dictation after dictation. 
They were funny to me, these contrasts like Music Lab, benefits of here versus there simply falling from sky. Music Lab, this is good, I said to Amina, half jokingly. Discipline of music is good training for medicine, nah? Miss Zalis, knowing lessons were impossible for us, took time to teach Amreen reading of music. Later, she quietly allowed Amreen to bring brass child's trumpet home, at first twice every week after music lab, insisting to Amina when she came to walk Amreen home that she needed an instrument back before school next day, but eventually allowing Amreen to take trumpet home on weekend too. What could we offer Miss Dalis in return? What else? To Amreen's embarrassment, but on my insistence, twice each week Amina would, after meeting school bus for twins who had no interest in music lab, Anisha preferring cereals like Full House, Adnan preferring American sports with neighbor boy, Steve Feeney. Amina would carry the school box of assorted donuts for Miss Dalis, our small gift of appreciation. Soon came surprise product of Miss Dalis's work. From third row of Amreen's fifth grade music concert, Amina and I, Adnan and Anisha between us, listened, enraptured, when after five or ten children at once, piped or stringed or drummed together, like squeaky medley of almost music, Amreen, on cue from Miss Zalis, began slowly to play trumpet as solo. An opening note of her song, her thin cheeks turned rosy, just as they do when she cries. Brass of her trumpet shined under stage lights, below Amreen's eyes shut in concentration. There, in silence of cafeteria, saddest musical notes I had ever heard fell upon my ears. For two full minutes, Amreen's song pierced my feelings, stirring memories long ago hidden and buried. Inside low notes of her song, I could not help but remember my parents, and especially my father, thin man with sagging stomach and deep thinking eyes, like mine, people said. How I never saw him again after I left Robobindi at 24. In somber notes of Amreen's song, I relived night of my departure from Bombay, inside crowded airport terminal, where before boarding, I bowed to my father for blessings. His hand shaking with emotion, emotion I could not distinguish between loss or hope. He touched my shoulder with prayers. Kamani makub barkatape. May you find great abundance in earning. Before he pulled me to his chest, his stomach pressed against me and choking on tears whispered, Mafkar, forgive me, Anil. Forgive him for what I didn't know. He had created so much. Dried fruit stall in bazaar was prospering. My decision to apply the lottery was no reflection on him. During Amreen's solo, I imagined my father as I remember him that day, in white shirt and white pajama, thin hair neatly parted, but somehow present here in Florida, walking in his cracked sandals through Duncan, admiring our sturdy commercial chairs, our steel vats in back to fry 20 donuts at once. I imagined him raising his hand before AC vents in the house, or standing at steps of community pool and preparing to enter, curls of hair on his chest gray and content, matted in same thickness as mine. But mostly I imagined my father seeing children, Amreen creating this beautiful song with brass instrument he would not recognize, her concentration as if she is lost deep in prayer. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. My name is <clears throat> Swathi Karana, and I'm gonna be reading um, from the first few pages of my novel, um, for which I'm very grateful for um, the Center for Fiction support and supporting, um, called The Number One Print Shop of Lahore. One September morning in 1945 in Liverpool, a wooden crate marked Wellington inched through the oyster gray sky, dangling like a, from the crane like a pendant held by a jeweler's tweezers. It was placed upon the top level of the Kampala, a turbine steamer along crates with mail to be distributed in Suez, Karachi, Bombay, Sydney, and Brisbane. The rest of the ship was packed up with dishes, woolens, coll collared shirts, biscuit tins, tufted furniture, penicillin, stained glass lamps, lace, 
white glue, cello tape, film reels, phonographs, bedsteads, encyclopedias, whiskey, rum, polo sticks, riding boots, saddles, bridles, lavender soaps, geranium perfumes, men's shaving brushes, and factory sharp blades. Assisted by two tugboats, the Kampala departed. Her horn was slow, low, and one, I imagine, as the whale of a rhinoceros. The Wellington, with its stenciled capital letters and Union Jack flag, was poised to face the journey through the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean. The sailors, once they were far enough from land, were thrilled to set aside their scratchy government issue woolens and strip to their light blue uniform shorts. It was September 1945, after all. The Atlantic floor was a graveyard of the war. The Kampala traveled over the innards of her sister ships, the Dernira, the Tripoli, all of whom had been torpedoed by German U-boats. For 18 days on the top level deck, the British sailors leaned against the Wellington, against the inked flag diagonals, tracing the edges of the flag's perimeter with their fingers, eating sardines, dried dates, and dehydrated potatoes, and drinking very watery beer. They splashed in the pool, fashioned from an empty container on deck F, and attempted to play table tennis on deck E, the ball bouncing off the low ceiling girders while the boat swayed side to side in near verticals. The Kampala rounded the jagged rock of Gibraltar, pushed through the Mediterranean, and entered Port Said. On land, two men in flowing white robes walked along sun-blanched estates, carrying black umbrellas and tuning a red transistor radio. On ship, sailors leaned against the Wellington, furiously ro rolling cigarettes, knowing they could replenish at Suez. They squinted their eyes into the sun and said the sand looked like snow, but they felt their skin sweat. Fifteen days later, Karachi came into sight. The Kampala passed mangrove swamps and berthed at the newly constructed West Wharf. The sailors waited for an available, cr available crane at the bustling Karachi port to hoist the Wellington onto a bullock cart, prolonging their farewell to the wooden box. On the streets of Karachi, the Wellington passed a convoy of camel-drawn flatbed carts with long pipes, college students walking to Lady Lloyd Pier, and a Russian man strolling by with the puppeteer's wooden cross tied to a circus bear. Fascinated by the possibility of the crate toppling, a group of young boys surrounded the slowly moving cart. At the station, the crate was heaved onto a diesel train headed for Lahore. For 20 hours, the Wellington moved through sunlit orange deserts through along the Indus Valley at dusk and past daybreaking green farmlands. Early in the morning, the crate arrived at Lahore Junction. It was heaved and plopped onto another bullock cart accompanied by four men in turbans in varying degrees of purpleness. When the cart was ready to move, the man with the darkest turban stood straight against the crate, his chest blocking the center of the flag. The cart rolled past Banda Bazaar for rolling pins, Bansa Bazaar for ba bamboo mats, and Kashmir Bazaar for woolen tea cozies. It went past Empress Road through Donaldtown, past the Lunatic Asylum, and circled three quarters around the roundabout into the township of Zumong, to the number one print shop, a letterpress typesetter and bindery owned by Birbal Bansi, my great-grandfather. And when the Wellington arrived six years after it had been ordered, my great-grandfather was careful not to smash the stenciled Union Jack. Even at that moment, he knew it could only be a matter of time until the physical vestiges of that flag would be worth saving, because little else of it, what it represented, would survive. My grandmother died before I could ask her about her father, before I knew to ask her, before I learned I was related to a man who bought a printing press and thought it could change his destiny. My grandmother died before I could ask her about her mother, before I discovered that I was related to a woman who was on the verge of marching with Gandhi, a woman who once believed she could change her country's destiny. Destiny is funny that way. The great beauty had finally arrived and the war was over, and yet my grandfather, Birbal, who had been waiting six years for it, was not prepared. A different man would have been downstairs measuring space, moving around this or that to make room. Instead, this man was on the rooftop eating fried cauliflower and a lentil stuffed paratha. He was contemplating a lie down on the chirpai when he heard the chokidar yelling, Master G, Master G, a big, big, big thing is here for you. With a full belly, Birbal ran down the outside stairs along the back of the house. Snorting in the fragrance of his wife's roses and overgrown grapevines covering the servants' outhouses, he coughed, out of breath, out of shape. In the corner of his eye, Birbal watched the water buffalo lounge under the thick shade of the jamun tree. 
He entered through the back entrance of the print shop, gliding over the smooth marble floors like a Russian ice circus performer. And there it was, a gigantic wooden crate, Wellington writ written under a screen printed Union Jack. The box was too big, impossible, criminally gigantic. It swallowed the daylight. Until now, nothing in his cramped shop had blocked the sun, not the black platen presses, the wooden type cases, or the gray metal files. On a regular day, the sun would plunge through the cracks of the jute curtains. But today, beer ball was in darkness. And yet, there stood his longing, the thing he wished for, and the thing that made his workroom dark and unusable. One more too big idea, he thought. A flash of Kothari came to him, that shiny round man with his chubby hairy fingers, hair strangled by the thick gold rings filled with giant polished stones prescribed by his, his, his astrologer, made the taste of curried cabbage from lunch come up Beerball's chest. How soon would Beerball have to start paying that lizard man who choked every businessman in these parts of Lahore? How much money would it take to finally get Kothari's calloused foot with talons as nails off his neck? Thank you. Hello, thank you. My name is Kay Igu. Um, I just wanna say a big shout out to the Center for Fiction for granting us this fellowship. Um, thank you for the invaluable time and space to create. The support has been incredible. And especially thank you to Sarah, our champion for the wonderful work that she's done for us. Um, and to the other fellows, it's been wonderful to share this experience with you and to get to know you and I wish you all the very best. Um, the work is titled A Fine Thing, and it's a collection of linked stories. The storyteller is young Ify, who assumes the voices of multiple characters and tells their stories. Tonight, I'll be reading an excerpt from the opening pages of the book. Um, just a quick cast of characters. Gigi is Ify's grandmother, Dobo is her uncle, and Grace is her aunt. They live in Houston. Thank you. The tenants at Gigi's house were as multivariate as they were constant. They paid little to no rent, so they weren't boarding as much as they were just visiting, like uninvited relatives who showed up in a storm, in a bind, and left only when their tanks were full and the skies were clear. They stayed for days at a time, months, what felt like whole lifetimes. They were homeless, transient, fresh off the boat. Many came back years later to pay their respects and fill our wallets with their gratitude. Their noise was enormous. To Gigi's dismay, doors were, left doors were left ajar or were otherwise slammed shut. The air conditioning system whined inefficiently against the open windows. Pots of water were forgotten and boiled away on the stove, covering the metal with a fine soot though wiped away easily at the touch of a finger. The house groaned under our combined weight, struggled constantly to meet our symphony of demands. There was the grind of the garbage disposal system working on bones, the numerous hot showers, toilets being flushed, grass forgotten and grown wild before a haphazardly moan. Leaves were raked into piles and left to blow over again. Gutters diverting rain and debris to the side of the house were perennially clogged. Grease stained fingers drummed against the walls. There was a constant flight of food from the fridge, the decimated pantry and the struggle to keep it stocked, the incessant beeping from the microwave, the drag of curtains against the daylight, and the creak of bed springs at night. All of this had seemed so great, choreographed by none other than Gigi, who, at the helm of her great ship, steered us all to what we were assured was the promised American life of satisfaction, milk, and honey. Of the five bedrooms in the house, only Gigi's remained single occupancy. I slept on a bunk bed that was commandeered nearly every weekend by a pair of heavy set cousins, one a severe bedwetter. Their mother pulled into the driveway long enough for them to hop in or out of the car before she peeled away with a honk to Gigi. Whatever she did with her weekends was beyond me. And maybe it was because she wasn't actually our blood that Gigi never pushed too hard to find out. Two adjacent rooms served paying guests. One room was currently occupied by a young man from Ghana, Desi, who was a student of medicine at a university downtown. 
The final room remained empty and held its breath like an installation on permanent display, waiting for its audience. I begged Gigi to let me pack into that room and claim the plush queen bed, but she promised a backhand if I kept asking, so end of discussion. I understood the room's importance when an unfortunate woman and her three small daughters occupied it for months. Her husband couldn't tolerate another pregnancy and forced her to spend the final months of her condition out of his doors. But, sm but mostly, the room was held for the occasional entire family that, wa that won a visa lottery or had found some other bit of fortune that brought them as a whole unit to the States. The treasures of whole lifetimes were then sheltered in two dressers, a closet, and tucked into the queen bed. Saturdays were spent in the garden while the house recovered. The backyard was large, unusual for the neighborhood. Gigi had the gift of greens, and she quickly turned the barren backyard into bounty. To the right were the, bed, were the beds of leafy greens, the squashes, and the petite garden eggs. Tomatoes climbed a broken ladder that was hammered to the fence. To the left were all of the peppers, the heavy bells on their delicate branches, the neat scotch bonnets, the tatashi in their unruly angry bunches. Along the entire back fence were neat rows of bright corn, the young okra, and the sorry patch of earth Gigi had given me to keep. The flowers didn't need coaxing. The hibiscus sprung to life on its own accord. Gigi's only frustration was the magnolia tree in the middle of the yard. Years ago, when she moved in, the HOA advised her to cut down the tree and make room for a pool. It would do wonders for her property value. Gigi refused, and in all that time, the tree had refused to give its white blossom. Gigi had been boarding people long before I came to live with her. She came to the States in her 50s, became a citizen in five years, and by 65, she had the benefit of retirement. She still worked part-time at an assisted living community, sometimes called ALCs, which was run by a penny-pinching Nigerian woman who insisted on paying her under the table. Working at the ALC and opening the house to boarders was how Gigi survived in the robust 90s economy. I asked Gigi why she chose Houston when she first came to America, which was to say, what special hold did this place have that it should, that it should become the place where our family would be transposed and replanted, where it would root and rot? Gigi shrugged and said that she liked the weather. It was that simple. Though it had been over a decade since I last saw Nigeria, I understood. Houston's three season pattern, humid, hot, wet, were as, similar as, were as familiar as the mid-year rains back home when the roads turned to mush, the windy season when the yams were harvested and fertile ground was blown seaward, ushering in a new year, and the hot season when everything shrank back to a solid core. One could move from southeast Nigeria to Gulf Coast, Texas, and never once have to reflect on the weather because those climate patterns were long in our bones. So many Nigerians came to Houston because someone, usually a family member, but sometimes a friend, told them that there were opportunities there. And they weren't wrong. Houston was a perfect incubator for enterprising, hot-blooded people, so already accustomed to the indelicate act of uprooting and resettling. In the early days of the newly minted country, Nigeria sent its students in droves to study abroad. The 1960s and 70s saw a huge migration of Nigerians who left home for fashionable Britain. Cold, nearly inhospitable climes and the often outright hostility of the people. But in the 1980s, America opened up to Nigerians in a new way, and this time we came by choice. And for us, when we come, we want to truly arrive, always in style, with pomp and circumstance, even when there is nothing dignified about the journey. It is common knowledge that anywhere you find them, Nigerians are one of the immigrant groups with the highest success rates. We had that astounding ability to thrive anywhere, to absorb and be absorbed in return. Dobo said it was unsurprising. True Nija works hard. Still, when Dobo received the call from the people at Gigi's work, he claimed 
that all that hard work was her undoing. They had called it momentary confusion, delusion. They said that Gigi had returned from an extended lunch break without having eaten. She was on one of her fasts, so perhaps the cause of her mania had been an angry hunger. She had upset one of the patients, an oftentimes belligerent grown white man with a severe learning disability. She had repeatedly called him Mwamu, my child. When the poor man cowered and refused, refused to respond, she grew incensed and grabbed him by the shoulders and shook him as one might be tempted to shake an unresponsive child. She was on the verge of serious physical violence when they finally pulled her away from him. The man had been greatly disturbed by the incident and had consumed two jars of peanut butter to cope. They phoned Dobo to please come and collect his mother before further necessary action was taken. Dobo complained. This was exactly the kind of thing he didn't like to be a part of. But he left his office anyway, got in the car, and drove across town to pick his mother up. It was only exhaustion, Dobo assured them. His mother had led a hard life, and the signs were beginning to show. She was not feeling herself, an interpretation of which could mean that she was physically ill, maybe dehydrated. But Gigi had the magic of multiplicity in her. Not feeling herself could have also meant that she was entirely, that she had entirely stepped out of her skin, that she, that she was an alien in her own body. With Gigi, nothing ever meant one thing. Everything was related, and there was rhyme, rhythm, and history to all of it. There was nothing that couldn't be divided and traced back to something that came before. For instance, according to her, the telephone was around long before anyone thought to call it a telephone. In all of Igbo land, villagers had been using the talking drum for centuries to communicate full, complex messages with the stroke of a hand on tanned hide. So you see, she said, we invented the telephone before America was even America. For Gigi, everyone and everything was in relation to each other and functioned in service of something else. There was no such thing as individuality. If you want to be alone, she used to say, go to the, wilder go to the wilderness and see if you don't find demons there waiting for you. She cited numerous prophets from the Bible who had been tormented by none other than themselves. She said that no one is just one thing. In your blood are all of your dead family members. You carry them all, and they all live through you. Your life is for them so that they may go on. I could just imagine all of my ancestors packing into me like a bunch of moochie relatives, couch surfing in my body for 80 years if we were so lucky. I was a vessel for multitudes. I didn't like the sound of that. I needed privacy in order to feel myself. But Gigi said that Christ was always there, our ancestors too. There was nothing that was indivisible. Even me, she said, I have so, so many inside of me. Everyone suggested that Gigi take some time to recuperate, to take it easy. She fought them all, and we took it as a sign of her good health. The ALC relented and allowed her to return to work, but only on Dobo's assurance that Gigi would receive extra help at home, and ad an additional pair of eyes. The idea was raised to find a live-in assistant, but Gigi revolted. She refused to be watched over by a stranger, and certainly not in her own house. Few solutions presenting themselves, checked but not checkmated, she grudgingly consented on the condition that the extra care come from one of her children. Even though mother and daughter had never known peace, it was decided that Grace would move into Gigi's house. Everyone gladly dropped the issue, and for a brief moment, all was quiet at 1111 Skycrest Drive. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Marie Holmes. Uh, thank you to everyone who made tonight possible, and thank you to all of you tonight for being here. Um, I'm going to read from a novel that I'm working on from page 94, which there are only that many pages because of the support of the Center for Fiction, so big thanks. Um, the main character's name is Maddie. 
Um, she's a lesbian. She's pregnant, about 34 weeks, and she is checking into a psychiatric ward. <coughs> Come on, this way. The nurse showed Maddie the art room, where a few student collages hung on one wall, like an elementary school. They peeked into another room, a blue-toned conference room that could have been in any office. A lot of the groups will meet here, said the nurse. She used a key on her lanyard to open an adjacent door. It was a small supply room, wire shelves reaching to the ceiling. Did you bring anything up with you from the ER? Maddie shook her head. OK, so this should be quick then, because part of this is I'm supposed to inspect your belongings, but we'll do that when someone brings them up. Did you come in with shoes? Yes. Do they have shoelaces on them? Yes. OK, so we'll have to hold on to the laces, but you can have the shoes if you want to try wearing them without the laces. For now, I'll just give you some no-slip socks. The nurse grabbed another pair of the seafoam green socks. Let's see, how should we do this? Usually I use the room, but it looks like your roommate is in there, and I don't want to disturb her. A roommate? Maddie's stomach sank, and the baby kicked, as though in reaction. The nurse grabbed a hospital gown and used one of the neckties to attach it to the steel bar of the shelving unit. Then she grabbed another corner of the gown and tied it to the shelving unit right across from it. It made an uneven curtain with a fairly steep downward slope. That'll work, she looked at it sideways, I think. Maddie pulled the edge of one of the gowns she was wearing into her closed fist. OK, so you stand on one side. Here, just stay here. The nurse lifted the gown curtain and passed under it. Maddie could see the top of her head, where her shiny ponytail was gathered, and below, the legs of her scrub pants from the knees or so on down, and her shoelace-free brown clogs. The expensive slip-on kind with the heel band. Lesbian shoes. Now take off one gown and just hand it over to me. Maddie untied a gown and tossed it over. If this were college, she thought, We'd be in a sorority together, and this would be a shower scene. And the other one, socks too. Maddie looked down at her bulging stomach. Was the linea negra getting darker, she wondered? Or was it just that her perception had changed after seeing herself in full view in the shower? Are you wearing underwear? Yes, I mean, kind of. They're the hospital ones. Perfect. I'll toss them and get you a fresh pair. Maddie was surprised by how quickly she felt the cold. All right now, I, I'm sorry about this. I need to ask you to do five jumping jacks. Jumping jacks, Maddie repeated. Yes, five of them. Yes, it's just to make sure you aren't, you know, hiding anything. The other option would be a cavity search, and I'd rather not put you through that. OK. Maddie swallowed. Understood. They don't have to be too, too vigorous. I just need to see your feet move. Maddie covered her dark nipples with the palms of her hands and pushed in her breasts. She jumped her feet out to the sides, and they obediently slapped the cold linoleum. Her belly bounced with the impact. She wondered if she jumped hard enough, she might be able to get some contractions going get herself sent back to labor and delivery, which now seemed like some sort of luxury hotel with its fresh paint and fresh flowers and non-contraband shoelaces. Two and Maddie counted silently. Three and four and five and she wiggled her feet back together and lowered her hands to her belly. There was a little tap down below and she imagined the baby reaching up to give her a high five. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Daniel DeStefano. Um, a quick heartfelt thank you to the Center for Fiction and um, Sarah and Noreen and everyone here and to the other fellows. Um, this has been such an amazing experience, and I can't wait to read all of your, your wonderful books someday in the future. 
near near future, hopefully. Um, I'm working on a novel called The Things I Do For You, which is about three generations of an Italian-American family. And this chapter is from the third generation. It's called La Pausa. I studied abroad in Italy, and though I tell people the semester was the most transformative experience of my life, truth is I was terribly lonely the whole time, missing my parents of all people and pining for a girlfriend back home whom I eventually cheated on with Brooke Heldon, a round-faced North Carolina girl cheating on her own boyfriend. Feeling an adult-sized guilt hanging off us like someone else's clothes, we each dumped our significant others within days of arriving home, lied to our parents, and met in DC, where we quickly discovered whatever nugget of chemistry spurring us to cheat in the first place had never made its way stateside. I never think of the Colosseum, the canals of Venice, the espresso, the food, God, not even the food, whenever I think of Italy, but rather the shame of letting one relationship fail and another to never take root, returning home to immediate singledom and overbearing parents whom I not only not missed anymore, but became downright vindictive towards as being something I could ever miss. And then came the new loneliness in me that had felt like a person who'd smuggled himself home in my luggage only to stalk me around every room in America. All of this was Italy's fault, not mine. So I hated Italy. I regretted ever going there, ever thinking I was Italian, ever being naive enough to believe love was as transferable as a baton in a relay race to the end of your days, passed breezily onward from her to her to her. So when Edie, while planning our honeymoon, asked, you ever make it to Sicily? I just told her, no. Isn't your family from there? Only my mother's father. Look at how cheap this is. No, I said, taking her laptop. Fly into Rome, then take a sleeper car to Sicily. It'll be even cheaper. Look at you, Rick Steves. <laughs> Edie worked all through college. She went to Ireland once with her entire family to meet some distant cousin before he died. She still wears the enormous green reunion shirt whenever we paint something. But she's never been to Italy and has always wanted to go. Come on, DeSalvo, she said, taking her computer back. We should do this. She knows of my cheating fiasco, but not how terrified I am that some ember of loneliness has been kept burning all these years, only to be stoked by a return to its source. Still, how nice a do-over could be. Rather than the empty chairs across from me my first go-round, there'd be Edie, my wife by then, stirring her cappuccino, then licking foam from the spoon, asking me how to say such and such in Italian, and me racking through every file in my brain to find the right word for her. We should, I told her, and meant it. Our already married friends warned us not to spend the whole cocktail hour taking pictures. We didn't. Not to get too drunk, we did. Not to book the honeymoon flight too early the next day, we did. And that it was okay if, rather than having sex after the reception, we just wanted to sleep. But we couldn't wait to finally be alone, calling each other Mrs., Mr., while undressing and making silly jokes. So this is what consummating feels like. Only to stop at one point and acknowledge, this is different, in a good way, yes, in a good way. And now, standing in Termini Station, a measly 24 hours later, not entirely sure whether I'm still hungover or already jet-lagged, I'm amazed at how familiar Italy is. The mechanically female voice tinning off the marble to announce delays, always delays. That Jacob's Ladder click, 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 click of the arrival departure board updating itself. The frustrated crowds of people gawking up to the board as if waiting for a sign from on high then grabbing their bags and scattering frantically to their trains. Edie's too busy rifling through our luggage to join me at the Informazione desk, where the clerk immediately begins speaking to me in English. He helps me book our overnight train to Sicily, points to which binario it will leave from, and directs me to where we can store our bags for the day. When I return to Edie, she has our whole suitcase filleted open on the station's floor and is too busy ransacking through every compartment to notice me. Booked our train. Where's that toiletry bag? Shit. I remember seeing it on the hotel floor, reminding myself not to forget it and forgetting it. My birth control was in there. Why pack that there? 
maybe I was a little preoccupied with getting married to you. Fair point. I know they're all Catholic here, but we can find some Italian birth control. <laughs> I'm not taking Italian birth control. Just pull out. Aye, aye, I say. She zips up our bag, and we walk only a few paces before I have to ask, did you really put it in that bag? She stops. Paul, just ask me what you want to ask me. Don't you still want to wait? Don't you? We are not even out of the goddamn train station yet, and we're already looking at each other with raised eyebrows. Congratulations, Italy. You have fucked me again. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.